Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lunching with the League. We will get started in just a moment. First, we did want to remind everyone that we do have closed captioning available. Simply click on that CC icon you see at the bottom of your screen, and a transcript should appear instantaneously. And we do want to let everyone know that we do have two very important upcoming events. Tonight at 7 p.m., we are working with All Voting is Local and Innovation Ohio to bring you the first in a series of many advocacy workshops. Tonight will be Advocacy 101, which will feature um, tips and tricks for navigating the State House. Um, we'll walk through how the State House actually works, um, the committee structures, and how to engage with your legislators. So you don't want to miss that. Um, again, that will be hosted by the Ohio Voter Rights Coalition. And then Wednesday, November 10th at 6 p.m., uh, Fair Districts, Ohio. Um, we are convening all of our volunteers for our regular volunteer huddle just to catch up and to activate around what's next for redistricting. And speaking of fair districts, we need everyone collectively to help move the needle on our fair map. So be sure to give to fair districts. Your gift to fair districts will support all of our efforts to end gerrymandering across the state of Ohio and to draw those fair maps that fairly represent the wants and needs of Ohio voters and communities. So you can go ahead and give to Fair Districts Ohio and our efforts at fairdistrictsohio.org. And Youth in Action, do you have a young leader in your life that wants to plug into the league and uh, take advantage of all of the different ways that we can advocate and organize around several different issues, including democracy and our social policy issues, anything from education to um, the environment to criminal justice. Uh, Youth in Action is an empowering space for those 13 to 25 years of age. Click on that link that Michael Barron will be dropping into the chat um, to engage and a Youth in Action leader will get back to you. And finally, we do want to encourage everyone today, if you're not a member to join the league, um, obviously we are champions for democracy, but like I said, we do engage in other social policy issues that may be of interest to you. We do have different levels of membership. As you can see the primary household and a $5 student membership um, because we do want everyone civically engaged and helping everyone access the vote. Uh, you can uh, join us at LWVO membership. Uh, that link will be in the chat as well. And uh, just a reminder, we do have closed captioning. Um, for those joining us a little bit late, click on that CC icon that you see there on the bottom of your screen for a live transcript. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Jen Miller, who is going to be moderating today's discussion with Ohio Secretary of State, Frank LaRose. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters team. We're a mighty team of volunteers and staff uh, and members who pull off lots of different awesome programs and work for voters. Um, let's keep in mind that uh, the League of Women Voters of Ohio is 100 years old. Um, our North Star is voters. And so we like to have conversations with lots of folks um, who impact voters. I can't think of anyone who has um, more influence on our elections than Ohio's chief elections officer, Secretary LaRose. Um, I'm going to say a few things about him. Um, he is our 51st Secretary of State. Um, and he's been doing this for three years, which he and I just talked about. Um, he, before he was Secretary of State, he was a state senator. Um, one of the things he did try to work on as a state senator uh, and, and did uh, uh, work on was redistricting reform, um, as well as we tried to work on uh, multiple early voting locations, several things. Um, LaRose uh, was given Legislator of the Year by the Ohio Association of Elections Officials in 2016. Um, he grew up on a, a small family owned farm and I know his parents also were business owners so like we have that in common. Um, both of my grandfathers were farmers and I grew up in a small business myself. Um, he uh, enlisted with the US Army um, and 101st Airborne ultimately serving for uh, as a Green Beret um, and he has won many accommodations and honors, including the Bronze Star. Um, and he is a graduate of Ohio State, 
uh, in consumer affairs and business, which sounds like a really fun degree that I might have wanted to get myself. Um, he and his lovely uh, wife, Lauren, and their three daughters just moved to Columbus recently. And with that, um, Secretary LaRosa is going to um, uh, start us off with some comments. Then we have some questions that I will ask, and then we will get into um, we'll have some questions that we can get from um, the audience. Of course, we have more things to talk about than we probably have time, as I think you all know. Um, but with that, Secretary LaRose, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Jen. And um, first of all, thanks to everyone for participating. I, I have been really looking forward to this conversation because not often uh, do I get to really engage in a conversation with a group of Ohioans that are so knowledgeable about elections issues. And of course, the league for now over 100 years has been uh, convening groups of Ohioans who care deeply about the same things uh, that, that, that we collectively care about, and that is elections issues, voting rights issues, uh, increasing civic participation and, and doing the advocacy work uh, necessary to make sure that that kind of thing can happen. And so uh, for the three years that I've been in this office, I've really enjoyed the collaboration that we've had together. Of course, that doesn't mean that we always agree, but uh, my wife and I don't always agree and we're going to spend the rest of our lives together, right? So it's an opportunity uh, for people that have a lot of the same uh, concerns and a lot of the same motivations to, to talk together. And so I really enjoy that. Uh, Jen, thank you for your leadership of the league, and thank you for the work that, that we've been able to do together. And I want to start with, with that, because uh, this collaboration that we've had, uh, me as the Secretary of State with the League of Women Voters, and this close working relationship really has made a difference. Uh, if you look at what we've been through over the last year and a half in elections administration, uh, the fact that we're able to, to, to closely work together has, has truly uh, made a good uh, impact for, for Ohioans. It starts with things like voter registration, which we've worked together on. And last year, uh, we had an amazing uh, participation in, in, in voter registration. We had a few different collaborations that my team led, things like uh, what we called Raise a Glass for Democracy, where we partnered with craft brewers around the state, and uh, a thing called Styling for Democracy, where we collaborated with barber shops and beauty salons, and we were able to, to get uh, really many thousands of people registered. In fact, last year we went over 8 million registered voters and the work that we do with the League of Women Voters is a big part of that. Uh, we've been able to, to get things done like uh, poll worker recruitment. Uh, last year we set a record for poll worker recruitment and uh, uh, the work that, that we do with the League of Women Voters has been very important in that regard. Of course, the advocacy work at the State House uh, is so important as well. And uh, we've been able to uh, to work together on some of those things. And, and again, uh, some of those things where, uh, you know, the input from the league has helped us to, to work to craft better legislation uh, with members of, of the General Assembly. Of course, also uh, the, the work that we did on the women's suffrage centennial. Uh, Jen talks about the, the hundred years that the uh, that the League of Women Voters has been in existence. We know that the League of Women Voters was born from the suffragist movement. And, um, and really led the suffragist movement uh, uh, before they became the League of, of Women Voters. And so we work to, to help to, to acknowledge that here in Ohio and really to talk not just about uh, honoring those great suffragists that brought about this important change, but to use that as sort of a pretext for uh, maybe invigorating and re-energizing a whole new generation uh, of Ohio voters about why this right to vote is so precious, uh, that people would fight so hard uh, to, to win it uh, and to protect it. And so uh, the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission gave us the opportunity to do that. The work of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission will continue, uh, although the commission itself ends here shortly. Uh, but now uh, the group will be working to finally bring about a memorial on the State House grounds uh, that will honor the suffragists. Uh, if you've if you've strolled our, our beautiful State House grounds, you know that, uh, and this is just shocking to me, uh, that there are a lot of great statues of, of men, war heroes, politicians, and that kind of thing. But the only way that women uh, are depicted on the state house grounds is as mythical, you know, angels and lady justice and, and this kind of thing. There aren't any statues to real Ohio women, and, and the suffrage movement is a great opportunity to 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 mark that important turning point from 101 years ago now. And so we're working to try to get that statue built uh, to get a memorial suitable tribute built. Uh, and hopefully to uh, inspire again a new generation of Ohio of, of Ohio voters. Um, so what I want to talk about first is, is what we've been through over the last year, uh, year and a half. Uh, a friend of mine, the former Kentucky Secretary of State, wrote a column 
in The Economist magazine where he uh, referred to the 2020 election as the stress test for American democracy. The fact is that in 218 years uh, that we've had a state here in Ohio, it's never been harder to run elections than it was last year. Uh, all of the circumstances that we faced uh, made it an enormously challenging year. And I don't need to go through what each of those are, but you all know, and it's not just the, the pandemic. Uh, it, it's the impact that that had on poll worker recruitment. It's this corrosive uh, disinformation that we had to fight against to make sure that Ohioans were empowered with accurate information about how to be a voter. Uh, it's concerns about the Postal Service. It's concerns uh, about, uh, about violence in, in, in some cities uh, throughout Ohio. I mean, all of these things added up to make last year enormously challenging. But when we were given that test, that stress test for American democracy, Ohio passed that test with flying colors. Many of you were part of that. Uh, we ran what in 2020 can only be called the most successful election in Ohio's history. And that's not hyperbole. That's not overstatement. Too many people in my line of work want to say something like it was the biggest or the most fantastic or the greatest ever, uh, and then not back it up with numbers. So if I'm going to say that 2020 was the most successful election in Ohio's history, I better be ready to back that up. So here are the numbers. Uh, let's start with participation. Uh, participation is not the only thing that you look at when judging whether an election is successful, but I think it's the most important. Uh, if people don't participate and participate in large numbers, then elections won't work. Um, and last year, we blew away any number that we've ever seen for participation. Uh, nearly 6 million people cast a ballot. That's 74% of all registered voters. We had eight of Ohio's counties that went over 80% participation and every one of Ohio's counties saw an increase over previous years. And so when it comes to participation, it is undeniable that last year we set the all time record for participation in elections. So that's one thing that I use when I define 2020 as our most successful election ever. But there's also a lot of other things to look at. How about this poll worker recruitment? As I talked about earlier, when other states had a shortfall, other states didn't have enough, they didn't have an adequate number of poll workers, Ohio had an overabundance. Uh, we launched five different recruiting programs, everything from youth at the booth to get high school seniors. Uh, we had a thing called a second call to duty, which was targeted at, at my fellow military veterans. Uh, we worked with professional organizations to give continuing education credits. I mean, we had all these different recruiting programs, plus collaborations with groups like the League of Women Voters. And so when Ohioans uh, stepped up to answer the call to duty, 56,000 of them did just that. There were 56,000 poll workers last year, which is, again, an all-time record. And what that meant was that we not only had a reserve force so that every one of our 4,000 polling locations could open on time, but that also helped create an army of truth tellers, people that were trained, that understood how elections really worked, that could push back on some of this corrosive and, and, and dishonest information that circulates around some of this election mythology and conspiracy theory that circulates. And so that poll worker recruitment piece uh, was, it was a big part of that. Uh, Ohio also had the lowest number uh, of provisional ballots we've ever seen. That's a, that's a good thing. We had the highest rate of absentee ballot returns that we've ever seen. 94% of absentee ballots were returned last year. That's another huge success. Uh, the fact that 94% of all absentee ballots were successfully returned to the Board of Elections is something that we've never seen before. And here's something that maybe people wouldn't think about, but you all as election gurus do think about this. The number of absentee ballots rejected because of a voter mistake was at an all-time low. Now, that's something that we look at very carefully. Uh, normally, it's about 1%. You know, somebody that fills out an absentee ballot may forget to sign it or forget to put uh, the right identification information on it or, or, or whatever else. Normally, that rejection rate is about 1%. Well, I was very concerned about that because we knew that we were also going to see an all-time high for absentee voters. And so we got really purposeful about redesigning the instruction form. So last year, when you got your absentee ballot, it came with a checklist. We worked with a group called the Center for Civic Design, uh, that, and sorry for the lawyers in, in attendance, but we took the lawyers out of designing the instruction sheet, and we put the graphic designers in charge of designing the sheet. And then, of course, we had the lawyers check it to make sure that it was right. We replaced that old instruction sheet that was just really a bunch of legal jargon with, uh, with graphics and, and pictures and, and checklists. And we also instructed the boards of elections to do something new. Uh, in past years, when a voter made a mistake on their absentee ballot application, they would be mailed a form to correct it. Of course, that may get there too late for them to do anything about it. So we told the Board of Elections, pick up the phone, 
send the voter an email, contact them personally. And the boards did that. It was a lot of extra work, a lot of extra, you know, overtime for the boards of elections to do that. But, but here's the bottom line. Instead of 1%, rejection rate that we normally see, we cut that together down to 0 0.42, 0 0.42. And so that means we reduced it by, by more than half. Uh, that may not mean a lot, to, but until you think about that, that, that's tens of thousands of ballots that were counted that wouldn't have been counted otherwise. Again, a, a huge success. Just the fact that we had such high participation in early and absentee voting uh, was, the, was the last thing that I really wanted to highlight because in Ohio, we saw a tripling in the number of early voters, and we saw a doubling in the number of absentee voters, and we handled that quite well in Ohio. When other states had logistical problems because they weren't ready for that increase in early voting or that increase in absentee voting, Ohio handled it quite well. Uh, and that's something that we all can be proud of. And we were, we were able to release those unofficial results on election night, and we were able to run an election that Ohioans knew they can trust. Listen, the 2020 election wasn't perfect. No election ever is. Uh, but what we ran can only be called the gold standard that the rest of the nation wants to follow. And that doesn't mean that we rest on that, right? Uh, we, we know that, uh, you know, even if, uh, even if the Ohio State Buckeyes win a national championship, that doesn't mean that they're going to just stop practicing and reviewing films. That doesn't mean that they're going to uh, just take it easy. They're going to go right back out there and start working on uh, being the best in the nation again next year. And that's exactly uh, what, what I've worked to do. Um, and, and part of that uh, is that we didn't make big changes. We don't need to make big changes. While other states have looked at completely overhauling the way they run elections, Ohio doesn't need to do that. We have a good set of election laws. There are some improvements that we need to make, but we don't need to make a top to bottom overhaul of our elections. And that's good news. And, and that's something that I've been very clear about uh, with our friends over at the General Assembly. Um, let's talk about election integrity, because it's something that is on a lot of people's minds, and it should be. Um, and, and I want to focus on the fact that Ohio runs elections where we have the right balance, where it is, as some say, easy to vote and hard to cheat, where we don't have to choose between security and convenience. We have convenient elections that are also secure in Ohio. So I reject this notion that some offer that you have to choose either security or convenience. In Ohio, we can have both, and we do have both, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, let me be very blunt about something. Voter suppression and voter fraud are both exceedingly rare, and we're going to work to keep them rare in Ohio. And this is where I think that there needs to be a very thoughtful conversation about this, because I think that there's too much hyperbole thrown around on both sides of the aisle about election issues and too much sort of loose talk about this. I stood just a few months ago in front of the hundreds of elections officials when they were here in Columbus, and I said this. I said, elections are always political. Of course, that's the nature of them. R versus D, this candidate versus that candidate, whatever. Elections are always political. Of course, they should be. But elections administration Elections administration must never be politicized, and it has been far too often. Again, it happens on both sides of the political divide. It is irresponsible when Republicans do it. It's irresponsible when Democrats do it. And so what I want to make sure that all Ohioans know is that reasonable people should be able to say we will not tolerate voter fraud and we will not tolerate voter suppression. Both of those things are illegal and ugly and unacceptable. And we'll put thoughtful policies and, and procedures in place to prevent voter fraud or voter suppression from ever happening. But an honest assessment will show you that both of those are exceedingly rare and we should work to keep them rare. Now we know why politicians use those, those hot buttons. It, it evokes human emotion. And I guess it's a good thing that we're emotional about our elections. People get fired up because they know that their vote is their voice. The right to vote is sacred and precious. Trust me, I've traveled around the world and seen elections in places where people don't invest a lot of emotion in elections because they know that it's not really going to make a difference. But here in the United States, a vote is a powerful thing. And that's why we, as Ohioans, um, do get emotional about it. As an Americans, we get emotional about it. And some, sometimes, unfortunately, politicians like to push those buttons on emotional issues. Um, Ohioans trust elections because we have that balance. One of the things that we do in Ohio to make sure that Ohioans know that they can trust elections is that we do a post-election audit. Now, there's a lot of talk right now about audits. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of people don't really understand how a post-election audit should be run. Well, again, I would submit for your consideration that Ohio 
is the gold standard for how to do it. Other states should look at how Ohio does post-election audits. Uh, in fact, the Bipartisan Policy Center just put out a study that, uh, that, that, that uh, looks at the way many states do it uh, and, and talks about how Ohio is a real example of how to do it right. Um, when we do a post-election audit in Ohio, it's conducted by both Republicans and Democrats who have sworn an oath and are bound by law to uphold that oath. Those Ohio Republican and Democratic elections officials count the hard copy paper and compare it to the electronic uh, record. And when we did that in 2020, we had a 99.98% accuracy rate, 99.98% fidelity between the electronic record uh, and, the, and the hard copy paper. That's something that more Ohioans need to know about. And so we're gonna work this year to really make sure that the word gets out because in a few weeks, we're gonna be doing post-election audits again. And that's something that we wanna really shine a spotlight on. And I hope you all will help do that as well. We're gonna be at boards of elections. I'm personally gonna be at many boards of elections. We're gonna to try to get cameras and, and reporters to come out and cover this because Ohioans need to know that we always audit elections. And, uh, and it's something that, that we take uh, quite seriously, of course. Um, one thing on post-election audits, uh, if you're interested, tune in to the Ohio channel uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday at 1 p.m., where we're doing another in our series of Ready for November Task Force conversations about post-election post audits. This is a conversation between myself and our, um, our county boards of elections who are getting ready to do that. Uh, one last thing on election integrity, as we work to make sure that we get accurate information out there, uh, I can shout it from the rooftops and I try to every chance I get to talk to the press about it, but it's so much more impactful when it comes from your friends and your neighbors. And so let's you all uh, take on the, the task of being election truth tellers, being sources of accurate information, just as I've asked our poll, uh, our poll workers to do. And just as I've asked our boards of elections to do, I told our boards of elections to get out to their county fairs this summer. Many of them were able to do that and set up a, a mock election where people could vote on their favorite deep fried whatever from the fair. And then as a result, that brought people in to the board of elections booth. And inevitably, somebody would come up with some conspiracy theory, say, hey, is this the voting machine with the secret internet connection that flips the votes? And, and I told the boards of elections, instead of Instead of laughing at those folks, because we know how laughable and how ridiculous that is, but instead of laughing at those folks, engage with them. Uh, give them some information, educate them. And, and, and I really believe that that's making a difference. I'm gonna ask uh, Maggie Sheehan for my team to share something, uh, voteohio.gov slash secure. You're gonna see there a, a one page infographic that we've put together that I think is a really accessible piece. Here's a, here's a like a poster size version of it that I have in my office. It's really easy to look at. It's easy to look through. If you have friends or family members, heck, maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want to arm yourself with this for the Thanksgiving dinner because we've all got that uncle or aunt, uh, that friend or family member that that has a head full of conspiracy theories because they've watched too many YouTube videos. Maybe consider printing those off to have a thoughtful conversation about how secure our elections truly are in Ohio. And again, I think that that's something worthwhile. The reason why I think this is worth uh, really focusing on is because voters won't participate in elections that they don't think are trustworthy. And so I think, again, that balance between making sure that elections are accessible and secure is important. And it's important for Ohioans to know that they can trust that when their vote is cast, it's going to be accurately counted. Um, let's look ahead. As I told you, uh, we don't rest on our laurels. Ohio runs some of the most secure and some of the most accessible elections in the nation. That's something that we're proud of, proud of but we don't stop with that. Uh, I've engaged with the members of the General Assembly to try to advance a thoughtful piece of legislation called uh, House Bill 294. House Bill 294 is our attempt to really focus on some of those small changes that we need to make instead of some of these, uh, you know, some of some other things that, that others have, have perhaps proposed uh, that would take us in the wrong direction. I think 294 helps keep us moving in the right direction by doing things like finally creating online absentee ballot request in Ohio. It is long past time that we have online absentee ballot request. It's something I've been pushing. In fact, I started pushing this seven or eight years ago when I was a new member of the state Senate. Uh, it's time that we get this done. Online absentee ballot request is part of that House Bill 294. Something else that's contained in that is to modernize the way that we do voter registration. One of the most important things that we can do uh, to maintain accurate voter rolls is to make sure that, that people keep that information up to date. And right now we have a paper-based process 
uh, as a result of the motor voter law, when people go into a Bureau of Motor Vehicles office, they're, they're handed a hard copy piece of paper voter registration form. We can do a lot better than that. And creating finally this automated uh, voter registration process is something that, that I think is, is a really good step forward. 294 also addresses some of the concerns that the bipartisan uh, elections officials have been raising for years. Uh, concerns about the logistics of the day before election and not being able to continue running early voting at the same time as they're getting ready for election day. We've seen that manifest itself in problems just recently at the Franklin County Board of Elections, and it's something that, that, that we need to be uh, very purposeful about. And the good news is we can eliminate that logistical problem that the boards have while maintaining the 218 hours of early voting that Ohio has that makes us one of the leaders in the nation. In fact, we can use that to create more evening and weekend early voting opportunities. Monday morning's not a great time for anybody. We can take those, those hours and create more evening and weekend hours and also free up our boards of elections to do what they need to be doing on the day before the election, and that's preparing for in-person election day. So those are just some of the things uh, that are contained in House Bill 294. I think it's a good step forward, and it's one that I hope uh, that you all will, will, uh, will support as we move through, through the, through the uh, legislative process and engage in that thoughtful conversation about it. I'm going to end with this, and then I look forward to the questions that we have. We've got work to do as people that care about elections, as a group of people who are passionate about voting rights, and I include myself uh, in that. Uh, we've got work to do. Uh, now is a time when people have uh, a, a lot of issues uh, on their minds about elections that they wouldn't otherwise. And I view this as a glass half full moment. Uh, people are talking about post-election audits. People are talking about uh, voting machine security, chain of custody, bipartisan oversight, all these things that the average person wouldn't normally be thinking about right now. Maybe they're thinking about it for the wrong reasons because again, they've watched too many YouTube videos or what have you, but this gives us a chance to do some civics education to really help engage people and, and get people to understand why elections are secure in Ohio and why they're, they're, they're important that they participate. Uh, I think that that's one of the important collaborations that we can do to fight disinformation and false information that's out there and also continuing to work on poll worker recruitment and getting people registered to vote and the advocacy work uh, that undergirds all of that. And so uh, I really care a lot about this uh, collaboration and this relationship that we have and I look forward to it continuing. Uh, and Jen, thank you so much for your leadership and I look forward to any questions that you all have for me. All right. Well, thank you so much. First, uh, we like to always give shout out to Barbara Brothers from Mahoning County is saying that the new uh, voting machines in Mahoning County are great. They're such a um, improvement, she is saying. Um, we have a question about 294. We, the league, there are a lot of voter advocates who are opposed to 294. League is neutral. We see that there's a lot of things in here that we've asked for for a long time. And then there are other things that we don't like. Are there pieces of 294 that you would also like to see improved? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and this is something that I've been plain spoken about. Listen, there's no such thing as a perfect piece of legislation other than maybe naming a, a bridge after a hero or something like that. Uh, but uh, as you know, when, 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 when the people in the stone building behind me start to do their work, it's an almost invariably going to be a, a process of some sort of compromise and, 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 and folks kind of coming together. Um, I think that one of the things that's in the bill that doesn't make any sense is restricting the use of secure receptacles to 10 days before the election. I've said that it just it doesn't it, that's not a there, there's no particular problem being solved there. Um, and so that's something that I think needs to change. Um, I, and, and I think that there are some other things where there's some, some room to work as well on that bill. But, but again, what, what I wanted to do and why I engaged with the legislature from the very beginning is I wanted to have a thoughtful conversation informed by actual elections officials, the hundreds of people that do the work of running elections. And, and instead of what you've seen in some other states where perhaps they've moved in the wrong direction, I wanted to sort of try to guide the conversation into a positive direction. Because again, we don't need to make wholesale changes to the way that Ohio votes. And certainly we don't want to make it harder to vote in Ohio. There's no reason to do that. Uh, and so uh, thankfully, uh, I think that we've been able to start a more thoughtful, sort of less hyperbolic conversation uh, about some modest changes. And that's what 294 is all about. Um, so, and I know you talked about this. So, and when you say receptacles, you mean drop boxes. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure people understand that. And I think they got that. But I have a lot of questions. My phone keeps people keep texting me their questions too. And there's just a lot about drop boxes, multiple early vote centers, multiple yeah. drop boxes, uh, you know, just more access, which I think we both know helps rural and suburban and urban Ohioans. So Absolutely. could you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, Jen, one that you know that I've been a longtime advocate for is more early voting locations. Um, that's uh, something that absolutely has to be changed in state law. Uh, I don't think it makes any sense that we have only one early voting location per county. Um, and so that's something that I think it, it's it's time that we, we made that change. That's something that, again, has to be done uh, by the General Assembly. I do think that our boards of elections have, have, have worked well with what they're given by sort of creating larger uh, polling loca uh, early voting locations and, and trying to, to manage their traffic flow there and that kind of thing. Of course, there end up being high volume times, uh, Saturdays, uh, Sundays, those kind of times, evenings end up being high volume times. And so there's no reason why there shouldn't be multiple early voting locations in each county. Uh, but again, that's a change that has to be. But one of the other innovations that we've had that I think has been uh, really useful, and, and it's unfortunate that not every Board of Elections has done this. I've encouraged them, but not mandated them to just because of the logistics and, and their own bandwidth and staffing and everything else. But I've encouraged them to have drive through drop offs available at the Board of Elections. If you if you dropped off a ballot in Cuyahoga County or in Franklin County at the Board of Elections during the early vote period, uh, you would see that you don't have to go to the drop box. Uh, they'll have a, a like a it almost looks like a chick-fil-a drive-through there they got multiple lanes and they've got uh, uh you know they've got the poll workers out there in, in, in reflective vests so that people can drive through and, and quickly drop off their their absentee ballots of course that's if you want to bring it to the board of elections in person uh still the easiest way to do it is to mail in your absentee ballot that's the way lauren and i submitted ours last year and then to go to voteohio.gov and track it um as it relates to secure receptacles drop boxes that kind of thing this is something where the legislature has to weigh in on this. Um, I've made it clear that, uh, that, that um, they are useful. They're not the end all be all either. It's not like the, the silver bullet solution to everything that ails uh, elections or, or whatever, uh, but they are a useful tool. And that's why what I did last year is expand the use of them dramatically. In fact, more than, than has ever been done in state history prior to last year, uh, there were only, what, four or five of them, and it was just at a few boards of elections, and there really wasn't a legal framework underpinning them being there. It had just been a decision that had been made by county boards of elections. So what I did with my team is we looked at 3509 uh, of the Ohio Revised Code, and uh, what it says is that there's three ways to return an absentee ballot. Uh, you can mail it, which is what, again, 90 some percent of Ohioans do, or you can personally deliver it to the director of the Board of Elections, or you can have a family member personally deliver it to the director of the Board of Elections. Those last two choices, either you or a family member personally delivering it to the director of the Board of Elections, is what I used to justify making sure that they're available at every Board of Elections. Expanding them beyond that certainly to do that just weeks before the election would have only invited not only litigation, but also potentially legislation. I can tell you that there are some members of the General Assembly that are not as enthusiastic uh, about the expansion of those. And so making last minute changes like this uh, is really detrimental to elections administration. And that's one of the things that we've avoided in Ohio that has led to chaos in other states. We're not looking to make changes in September or October uh, to something as important as the way people return their absentee ballot. But if that is something that is to be done, I would support it at the General Assembly. Uh, I would support the General Assembly expanding the use of uh, secure receptacles, uh, so-called drop boxes at locations uh, other than the Board of Elections. There have to be rules for that. They have to be under video surveillance. There have to be certain uh, security standards. They have to be emptied on a daily basis. And then there are some other things that have to be talked about, um, like what happens if somebody destroys a Dropbox. And this happened in both California and I think Massachusetts, where people had, you know, uh, set them on fire and this kind of thing. And so uh, th that's something that you have to think about what happens in that scenario. It's not, again, one of those things that you just figure out just a few days before early voting begins. Thank you for that. Yeah. So um, getting a lot of notes about uh, mail service, and I, we don't want to beat up on USPS. We really don't. But I think many of us have had things that never arrived. Um, Sue Mancino says that uh, she sent a check 
for her ta taxes to the county um, that never got there. She mailed it in February. Um, and so she's afraid of putting her um, ballot in the Dropbox. Her idea, I mean, her, her ballot in the mail, she would like to have a Dropbox. Her idea is, is actually to have some at postal service, you know, so actually at post offices, just wondering if you're thinking or libraries, things like that, where we already have kind of um, potentially secure locations. Yeah, again, that would be something that uh, if considered in the legislature, I'd be fine with that. It's something like a government facility where you want to have these. Uh, but but let, let me talk about the Postal Service, because last year, um, what I did as the co-chair of the National Secretaries of State Elections Committee uh, is with my counterpart from the state of Michigan. And, and by the way, we've got a great partnership. It's funny because you'd think that a Democrat from Michigan and a Republican from Ohio probably don't agree on much. But uh, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson and I uh, have a great friendship and, and, and we work well together. So together we co-chaired the National Elections uh, Committee for the National Association of Secretaries of State. We convened a conversation uh, actually several conversations last year with the United States Postal Service. And I will say that they were quite responsive and performed well uh, when it came to elections time. Now, where they ran into some real problems last year was after the elections during the holiday season. And they'll tell you that election day is not uh, a high demand day for or the period of election month leading up to that is actually not a period of high stress for the Postal Service. It's that holiday season when they run into some of the most challenging logistical problems. But they were responsive with things like moving Ohio sorting back into Ohio so that in places like Toledo, they weren't shipping mail to Detroit to be uh, sorted. Or in the uh, eastern part of Ohio, they weren't shipping mail into Pittsburgh to be sorted. They kept it in Ohio. We also were able to establish a direct person-to-person -person contact for every one of our boards of elections with their local postmaster. And this has been one of those success stories that, again, the average person wouldn't talk about. Uh, but or doesn't wouldn't be aware of. Uh, but now, if you go to your board of elections, they know the local postmaster. They have their cell phone number. They talk to them frequently. And when it is Saturday afternoon uh, on the weekend before election day, they're talking to them at three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon, saying, "Hey, can you guys keep the door unlocked because we're coming down there with one last batch to drop off or whatever else." That kind of interpersonal communication between the postal service and the boards of elections is an all new thing, and it has really has made a difference. And again. The ability to track your ballot uh, is, is, is crucial in Ohio. VoteOhio.gov uh, is the place to go to track your ballot, and we encourage Ohioans to do that. This is also, by the way, why we need to address this um, the, the, uh, the, the deadline for uh, absentee ballot requests. And this is something where most states cut that off a week before the election, uh, at least. Some states do it 10 days before the election. In Ohio, the law allows you to request an absentee ballot up until noon on Saturday, and if we encourage people to procrastinate, and procrastination is part of human nature, um, then people are going to procrastinate. And some people are going to request an absentee ballot at that absolute last minute. That's where I start to get really concerned. Uh, what we should do, and what uh, you know, I've I've supported legislation that would do this, um, would be to cut that 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 request period off a week before the election. Again, some have chosen to do the partisan thing and demagogue that and say, oh, look, that's a reduced, uh, you know, re reduction in, in, in opportunity for mail-in voting. No, it's not. It's just smart logistics. If you request an absentee ballot two days before the election, the chances of it arriving at your house and getting returned on time start to become very low. And so some things aren't voter suppression or a insidious effort to try to harm people. It's just smart logistics and good elections administration. And that is, uh, is, is one of them about um, permanent absentee lists. So if you think about individuals that maybe they have their sight impaired or they're just more comfortable doing it at home or, uh, but they're folks that their condition isn't gonna change. They're not, they're quite, they stay in one place. Could we get a permanent absentee uh, list? So that's another thing that would have to be done in legislation. Here's the idea that I've had, Jen, and I think we've talked about this. What, what I have proposed instead of a permanent list is an ongoing opportunity to request the next election at each time you vote. And so what I mean by that, it would sort of be a chain reaction uh, kind of a, a process. So when you send in your absentee ballot two weeks ago uh, for this fall's general election, there could be a box right there where it says, send me one for the next election. 
And so that way you're reaffirming every, you know, five or six months. Hey, yeah, I still want to be, I still want to get an FC ballot. I still want to get an FC ballot. That way it wouldn't be permanent on in infinitum forever and ever. But what it would do is when you submit your FC ballot for this election, you could simply request one for the next election. That's the idea that I've had. But again, something like that may, may require legislation as well. Uh, certainly something I'm open to though. So we've gotten um, several questions about the confusing language and the budget about public private partnerships. Uh, and so we wanted to hear kind of how you're interpreting that and moving forward in light of that language. Um, it is crucial for the Secretary of State, any Secretary of State, and this has been the case for, for my predecessors as well, to be able to work with community groups, um, ideological groups, non-ideological groups, really any Ohioans that, 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 that can, uh, to help get people registered to vote, to help encourage uh, voter participation, to do poll worker recruitment. Uh, and that's something that I have done uh, very aggressively. In fact, we, we've, we've leaned into that work with our collaboration with barber shops and beauty salons. Heck, there's a guy uh, just a, two miles from here in Columbus um, who, who did over 2,000 voter registrations at his barbershop. It's a barbershop here in Columbus called A Cut Above the Rest. And he did over 2,000 registrations because he was waving the neighborhood kids in and saying, hey, you, you turned 18 this year. Come on in here and get registered. But those kind of collaborations really do make a difference. Our Raise a Glass to Democracy initiative, where we had barber, or where we, we had brew pubs, um, micro brews all over Ohio, where their wait staff uh, had shirts that said every vote matters, and they had beers uh, cans of, uh, of beer and bottles of beer that had a message on it about how to get registered to vote. That kind of thing does make a difference. Now, what the General Assembly told me, and this is where it's important for them to work with us, uh, because we're the ones that actually carry out the laws. They write the laws. That's how, you know, that's how this works. Um, uh, what they were trying to do was to prevent uh, some out-of-state person from being able to write a big check for uh, elections administration purposes. And so that's fine. If that's their, uh, if that's their goal, uh, then there are ways to do that. I think that uh, what they wrote uh, accomplishes that and then some, right? And so I, my, my thought is that it's a, uh, a, an issue that they need to uh, clarify. Um, I think that they just didn't draft it as well as they could have, uh, perhaps. Uh, but I know that what they've told me, legislative leaders in both chambers have told me that it was not their intent to keep the Secretary of State's office from doing what every Secretary of State has done, and that is working with groups like the League of Women Voters uh, or, or any other group to do voter registration, poll worker recruitment. I mean, this is kind of a basic competency of this job, and these are the things that we have to do. Um, so it, we've only, we don't have much time left, but I do have a few questions for you. One is there's another piece of legislation that's being discussed um, that is really extreme, HB 387, um, that would make it much more difficult to register or to cast a ballot. Um, so would you want to comment on that one at all? Yeah, listen, Jen, there are hundreds of bills introduced every year, and most of them get one hearing and then never go anywhere and die at the end of the General Assembly. I anticipate that that's what happens to this. I, I, I've made it very clear that I don't support that bill. Um, I don't think that that bill particularly solves any problems that are, that are in need of solving. 294 does. We identified uh, what the elections officials have told us they need us to work on. And that's what, again, that thoughtful conversation has resulted in 294. Uh, but this other one, again, I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, certainly, I have been outspoken about opposing it. And, um, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't lose sleep about it personally. Okay, thank you for that. I hope it doesn't go anywhere. Um, we, I want to make sure the audience knows that we agreed that we weren't really going to talk redistricting, um, but obviously you know you would expect that we would get those questions given that we started fighting gerrymandering in Ohio in the 70s um, with folks like Joan Lawrence, Republican lawmakers who were introducing bills every General Assembly and finally getting on the ballot. So is there anything you wanted to say about what we could do better um, or, or what your vision would be to actually, or how we can actually get to fair maps in Ohio. Well, and Jen, and you know my history on this as well. One of the first things I did as a brand new member of the state Senate is partner uh, in a bipartisan way 
uh, with people like Tom Sawyer, uh, former state senator, former congressman from Akron, and Ted Celeste from here in the Columbus area, and, and, and others, uh, eventually uh, Senator Vernon Sykes as well, and, uh, and, and, and introduced uh, several bipartisan proposals to, to uh, reform this process. It's been something that I've been passionate for a long time about. Uh, unfortunately, because of you know ongoing litigation and, and all of that, it's not something I can talk a lot about, but I will say this, and you've heard me say this publicly, I am deeply disappointed um, that, um, well, candidly, that, that, that there wasn't an opportunity, there wasn't the ability for the commission to reach a bipartisan consensus on 10-year maps. That was always my goal, and I didn't give up until the bitter end. In fact, you, if you, you were there in the room, you saw me fighting until the very last moment to try to bring people together, pulling people out of the room to go talk to them in a private side room and like, hey, is there a way that we can still salvage this? Uh, unfortunately, uh, in order to get that done, uh, would have taken more members of the commission that were interested in, in finding that bipartisan compromise, and, and we just uh, weren't able to get there. So that's a, um, it's something that, 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 uh, that I'm deeply disappointed about, and, and uh, you know, that's where it is for now. Yeah. Well, we're going to, and uh, one thing I just want to mention to everyone is that here at League, we really believe in de deliberative dialogue with anyone. Right. Uh, um, and we think one of the biggest dangers we have in our democracy is actually that echo chamber, the idea that we only talk to people we agree with, um, that I think that fuels a lot of um, the problems that we have today, not just in voting laws and voting access or understanding um, elections, uh, but overall in general. So I do want to thank you, Secretary LaRose. Like we certainly agree on a lot of things and then we also spar. Um, and so I just want to thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, just a couple more quick questions. The first is, what do you think is the most important thing we can do to increase voter turnout? Yeah, I think it's a, it's it's um, reinforcing uh, the security and the accessibility of the process that we have here in Ohio. Uh, of course, we've done a lot of good things over the years to make it more convenient, and that's good, right? We want it to be convenient, but there's not exactly a really there really isn't a linear relationship between convenience and participation, right? What draws participation is motivation when people are. Are, are passionate about an issue or a candidate, uh, when people are passionate uh, about trying to change something uh, in either their community or in the state or in the nation, that's what, that's what, what, what helps people to turn out. And so uh, civic education is crucial in this. We want it to be convenient, but we also want people to know that it's trustworthy. And that's something that, that, uh, that is just uh, a team effort in making sure that we reinforce that. And again, let's all, as, as election uh, uh, gurus, as voting rights advocates, as people that care about this stuff, let's all commit to, to a thoughtful dialogue around elections and trying to reject this really partisan hyperbole about you know massive widespread voter fraud, that's not true, or massive widespread voter suppression, also not true. All of that kind of partisan hyperbole uh, really has a chilling effect on making people not want to participate. If people believe that there's all this fraud or that there's all this suppression, then why would they want to participate in that process? The fact is both are rare. Let's keep them rare by being thoughtful about it and by carrying out the laws that we have here in the state of Ohio and reinforcing how much a vote really does make a difference. And again, and, and on that, our leagues, you know, we have 4,000 members, most of them are volunteers, and we're probably the largest voter registration, volunteer voter registration org in the state. Um, and, you know, over 30 local leagues that are doing nonpartisan candidate forums, vote411.org. Um, we, at, we reached a million Ohioans in 2020 with nonpartisan voter information. So what, are, what, what should League be doing to best serve voters who are our North Star? Yeah. Uh, voter registration is so important. It's like hygiene. You've got to do a little bit of voter registration every day. It's like brushing your teeth, I've, I've told people. Uh, thankfully, in Ohio, we make it easy. I was proud to sponsor the legislation that created online voter registration in Ohio. Uh, and I think that that has made a difference. The next 
logical step in that is to automate uh, and modernize the process at the BMVs, but voter registration is crucial. Think about if we all stop and think right now, we can think about somebody in our life that turned 18 this year who moved to Ohio recently. Uh, we all need to reach out to those folks and help get them registered. And then also to encourage them to participate as a poll worker. It is a great education in how elections really work. And one of the best ways that we have to, again, create that army of truth tellers to understand uh, what uh, what real safeguards are in place to make sure that elections are, are honest. And again, when you engage in those conversations, again, maybe it's at your own family's Thanksgiving gathering, uh, and you've got a family member who is an election conspiracy theorist, instead of laughing at them or dismissing them, which is tempting, try to educate them, uh, because we're all in this together, and, and elections work uh, when not only there's massive participation, and that's something that we've seen here in recent years in Ohio, but also when people are confident that their vote was honestly tabulated, accurately reported, uh, and that's what we need to reinforce here in Ohio. And hopefully not gerrymandered, right? Um, I'm getting a lot of comments that that helps voter turnout as well. My last point I wanted to make, because it keeps coming up, is just things like the chain of custody where we have Republicans and Democrats um, kind of looking over each other's shoulders. That's something that the league helped get into law. The same with post-election audits, that's something we've championed. And so um, we are proud of the system we have here in Ohio in terms of that security. Um, of course, we worked with you on Senate Bill 52. Um, and so uh, I do think the army of truth tellers is a, is a cool idea, um, not just in the general public, but in our uh, general assembly and in the media. So please count on us if they're, when you're doing those audits, if you wanted to have a league person join you, we would love to do that. Um, but in the meantime, we wanted to give you the last words. Well, thank you, Jen. No, and I appreciate that. It's, um, I'm glad you mentioned the bipartisan nature of elections administration. And I think sometimes uh, we can just take that for granted because it's how we operate in Ohio. But, but, but it truly is a, a remarkable thing. And when it feels like in Washington, Republicans and Democrats can't agree that today's Monday, I mean, it's particularly dysfunctional there. Um, you've got an example at every one of Ohio's 88 boards of elections and every one of close to 4,000 polling locations of Republicans and Democrats coming together to do a remarkable thing. Um, for thousands of years, and not to get sort of romantic or philosophical about this, but for thousands of years on this planet, uh, the only way that power transferred from, from one hands to another uh, had to do with heredity uh, or with violence, right? And um, we live in a time where it's truly um, a golden time uh, for, for, for democracy, for self-rule. Uh, now, we obviously have our challenges, and, and we're dealing with those challenges, but uh, the fact that uh, we have a situation where every uh, eligible Ohioan can cast a ballot, uh, regardless of age, uh, regardless, sorry, uh, over 18 uh, can, and then and, and we know that it was just 50 years ago that, that, uh, uh, that it was 21. Uh, we know that, that it was just 100 years ago uh, that, that, um, uh, that women finally got the right to vote. We know that in large parts of our country, just 55 years ago, there were systemic efforts underway uh, to prevent people from voting based on their, uh, their race or ethnicity. The, the, the fact that we live in a time where truly every eligible voter can cast a ballot is a really remarkable thing. And it's something that we all need to embrace. And it's done in a strictly bipartisan manner in Ohio. It takes both a Republican and a Democrat to do everything that the Board of Elections does. As I always remind people, even the building is bipartisan. When you go see the, the Board of Elections, there's two locks on, on every door. It takes a Republican key and a Democratic key to even get into the room where the voting machines are stored, where the ballots are kept. It's like those old submarine movies from the 80s where it takes two keys to launch the torpedo. It, uh, uh, it makes sure that it's that trust but verify kind of mentality. And so um, the bipartisan nature of this is important. And, and that's something that, uh, that we really embrace and are proud of here in Ohio. Um, I wanna offer just a continuing conversation, Jen. Uh, and for, for all of your members, I think that this makes a difference. Um, my email address is just frank at ohiosos.gov. You're always welcome to reach out to me, frank at ohiosos.gov. You'll find me on all the different social media platforms where I encourage a civil and thoughtful conversation. Uh, unfortunately, there are too many people that, that, uh, that, that think that that pane of glass uh, allows you to be uncivil or, or unkind to one another, but uh, um, we work to, to maintain a civil and thoughtful conversation on social media. And that doesn't always mean that 
Uh, it needs to be people only who I agree with. It, it, I hope that uh, that you all engage in that thoughtful conversation on all the different social media platforms where I am as well. And, uh, and Jen, this work continues. Uh, what we have here in Ohio is some of the best election laws in the country. We have some of the best election administrators in the country. Of course, there's always opportunities to make it better. Uh, we have had successive years of record turnout, uh, and that's something that I hope will continue next year in 2022, as uh, the next big election is always just right around the corner. And so now is the time to do voter registration, to do poll worker recruitment, and, uh, and to make sure that people are well informed about how trustworthy and honest Ohio's elections really are. So thank you so much, everybody. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much. I think I have a few announcements, um, but thank you, Secretary LaRose. Here is uh, his uh, information. If you would like to reach him, um, the ongoing dialogue, I do know that to be true about the secretary is that we do try to um, work through a lot of things. Next slide, um, we will continue to do that. Um, next year's a big year, we'll have to have you back. Um, a few other upcoming events, just to keep in mind. Um, advocacy workshop tonight, Fair Districts Huddle for those volunteers Wednesday night. Next slide, um, you know, fair maps uh, are so important and we're gonna be continuing that work. We will not stop until we get them. So please consider donating. Oh, our young people, we're so proud of them. Um, just so folks know that this is a brand new program that now we have two young people who've been elected by Youth in Action to be on our board and we will continue to have that. We call that the democracy bug. Let's get young people excited about participating in democracy by giving them a space right here um, in league. Next. Um, if you aren't a league member or you need to update your league registration because it's it's out of date, your league membership is out of date, here's how you do it. And I think that's probably it. Thank you so much. LWVOhio.org is always here for you. And uh, we appreciate you, Secretary LaRose, Maggie, Michael, Cynthia, Nazik, Alice, Munia, Lisa, all the people. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right.